We previously discussed the difference between categorical and quantitative variables. It's important to know which variables you're working with. The ways that we analyze and display them are very different. Today, we'll see two of the most common ways of displaying categorical data. Here is a data table for 10 people who were aboard the Titanic. We see this table shows four categorical variables, survival, age, sex, and class. This table is just how the raw data would be stored. It's not easy to look at this table and draw conclusions about the distributions of any of these categorical variables. To get a better idea of how a categorical variable is distributed, we can make a separate table that shows the distribution. The distribution of a categorical variable lists the categories that the variable takes on and gives either the count, or the percent of individuals that are in each of those categories. For example, one of our categorical variables is class. The categories in this class are first class, second class, third class, and crew. So we could make a table showing us the numbers of people on board the Titanic who belong to each class. That would be a frequency table, although sometimes we may also want to make a relative frequency table. Rather than just showing the numbers of people in each class, a relative frequency table would show the percent of the total that is in each class. Here is a frequency table for the class variable. Again, you can see each category the variable takes on is listed, first, second, second, third, and crew. And then we have the counts, the frequency in each category. Oftentimes, the total is also included. This can be a good check. If we know that our data consists of 2,201 people, then when we make a frequency table, we should have a total of 2,201. This definitely gives us a better idea of how the class variable is distributed than a raw data table like this. However, there is still some room for improvement. Oftentimes, it may be better to know not exactly how many people were first class, but what percent of people relatively were first class. For that, we use a percent. We can take the number of people who were first class, 325, and divide by the total to see the percent of people which were first class. That gives us 14.77%, and we can continue in this way to construct a relative frequency table. At a glance, 325 people in first class doesn't tell us that much. We have no idea how big of a part of the whole that is, and we can only compare it to other categories by comparing those raw numbers. But as a percent, 14.77%, we can immediately look at that and recognize that it's certainly a minority of the total, since the total would be 100%. Just as the total counts in the frequency table should add to the total number of individuals in our data, in this case 2,201, in a relative frequency table, all of those relative frequencies should add to 100%. Although sometimes if you do these calculations, it's going to add to something like 99.99% because when you calculate relative frequencies, you have to do division and sometimes you have to round. So a little bit of round off error could occasionally make your total not quite 100%, but that's no cause for concern. Again, it's just round off error. Again, the distribution of a categorical variable is the way in which individuals in our data are distributed across the different categories of the categorical variable. These are two ways to show that with a table, a frequency, and a relative frequency table. Both of these tables can give us a good idea how a categorical variable is distributed, but there is still room for improvement. There's some visual flair lacking here. So let's look at two common types of charts for categorical variables. These are the pie chart and the bar chart. This is a pie chart for the number of individuals in each class on the Titanic, and this is a bar chart for the same thing. You can see that a pie chart is a circle, the circle representing the whole, all people aboard the Titanic. The circle is then split into slices, where each slice is representing a certain category 
in our categorical variable of class. Of course, the size of the slice is determined by how many people are in that category. As we saw in our table, the largest slice should be the crew slice that has the largest number of individuals in its category. And indeed, in the pie chart, you can see that the crew slice is biggest. Third class is second biggest and second and first are of a similar size. That, of course, agrees with our table, where we saw that first and second class had 325 people and 285 people, respectively. Notice in the pie chart that the category represented by each slice is just written in the slice, though it could be done other ways. Oftentimes, a key will be put over here where it just tells you which category each color responds to. There are many different ways to format a pie chart, but the idea is the same. If desired, we could also put the actual count numbers in the pie chart. For example, there were 325 people in first class, so I might go to first class and put a 325 in there, and so on. We could write the actual counts in these slices if we thought that was important to include. The bar chart very visually separates each category from the others, and it makes it a little easier to compare category to category, although it's a little harder to compare each category to the whole. You can see that, again, each category gets its own bar, first, second, third, and crew. Just like in a pie chart, each category gets its own slice. The height of each bar is determined by the number of individuals that belong to the category. We can see from the bar chart that the number of people in third class looks to be just under 750. And if we go up to our table, we see that's true third class has 706 people in it. Both of these charts can be very useful, but they definitely have their differences. Pie charts and bar charts are good only for categorical data. When we deal with quantitative data, we're going to need different charts. So these are categorical data displays. For a pie chart, it's particularly good when you want to emphasize each category's relation to the whole. We can immediately look at first class here and see it makes up a relatively small slice of the whole whereas the crew makes up a pretty large percentage of the whole. For a pie chart, it's also important that the categories don't overlap. Visually, you can see that everything adds to one whole, but if there's overlap in the categories, that would actually be misleading, because if we were to add everything up, it would be more than 100%. For example, consider 100 people and the categorical variable of what sport they play. Maybe 60 of the people play basketball, and maybe 50 play baseball. Some play both basketball and baseball. So if we were to say, well, 60% play basketball, 50% play baseball, that doesn't make sense for a pie chart. Those add to 110% because there's overlap in the categories. So for a pie chart, categories can't have overlap. Also, you're really only going to consider a pie chart if you have technology to assist you. This is not something that's easy to make by hand. You'd have to figure out all the angles to cut the circle into the proper areas and everything. Not very easy. On the other hand, a bar chart is great if you have to make a chart by hand. It's pretty straightforward. And if you want to compare a set of quantities measured in the same units, which may or may not make up a single whole, a bar chart works fine. It's totally fine if categories have overlap in a bar chart. There's nothing visually about a bar chart that suggests all the categories together make up a single whole. In this case, the categories do, but that's not something that is implied by the bar chart. In the bar chart, you can see that it's the counts of people in each category that are really being displayed with each bar. But like we saw before, we can make a table with counts or with relative frequencies. And the same is true about pie charts and bar charts. We could modify either of these charts to display relative frequencies instead of those raw frequencies. In the case of a pie chart, that's only going to make a difference if we're writing the numbers in the slice. So instead of writing 325 people in first class, I could write 14.77% in that slice if I wanted my pie chart to display relative frequencies. For the bar chart, if we wanted to modify it for relative frequencies, we would have to change the y-axis. And that looks like this. The bars, their heights, how they compare look exactly the same, but now the y-axis is going from zero to whatever percent it needs to in order to accommodate all of the bars 
bars, and the height of each bar is determined by the relative frequency of the category that it represents. We can tell from the chart that the crew makes up about 40% of the total number of people, which of course is verified by our relative frequency table. If you're just asked to make a bar chart, either a relative frequency or a frequency bar chart works fine, although if you're not asked to do something specific, you might as well just use the raw counts since you don't have to do the division necessary to calculate the relative frequencies. One last example here will help exemplify the difference between these two types of charts. Consider this table, which shows the percentages of different age groups that use TikTok. For example, 67% of people aged 13 to 17 use TikTok. 8% of people aged 45 to 54 use TikTok, and so on. If we wanted to use a display for this data, which display would be most appropriate? Pie chart? Bar chart? Does it not matter? What do you think? Well, remember what we said. Visually, a pie chart suggests the slices make up a whole. However, in this case, that's not what we're going to have. The data is a bunch of percentages. Each percent is of a certain whole, 67% of all 13 to 17 year olds, but the percents are of different holes. This is 58% of 18 to 24 year olds. This is 8% of 45 to 54 year olds. If we try to display all these percents, they're certainly not going to add to 100. They're certainly not going to make up a single whole. So a pie chart would not be appropriate here. A bar chart, on the other hand, works fine. So again, since each percent is of a different whole, a pie chart is not gonna be appropriate. We would want to use a bar chart, and here's an example of that. This also is an example of a bar chart where instead of going vertically, the bars go horizontally, and either one can be used. This bar chart does not suggest that all the percentages together make up a single whole, which is good because they don't. But the bar chart does make it very easy to see that 13 to 17 year olds by far are the highest percent age group using TikTok. We can see that 55 plus year olds barely use TikTok at all. But that's a little bit about bar charts and pie charts. I'll leave a link in the description to a video where we just go through making a bar chart by hand rather than showing you these pre-made ones. So if you really want to see the process, be sure to check that out. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and also be sure to check out my statistics course and statistics exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and extra practice. And if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in my courses. Thanks for watching.